The Mendes Unicoast Audubon Society welcomes you to a brief video on the sparrows and finches that live along our coast. This video is intended as a refresher for those who will participate in one of our local Christmas bird counts, and also as an informal introduction for those who want to know more about these little brown birds. We will focus on the common species that occur in winter, but we will also highlight those that live on our coast year-round. Like some other groups of birds, such as gulls and shorebirds, this assembly of small, similar-looking brown birds can be confusing when first we try to learn their names. So in this video, I will try to give you some simple tools to help you sort through this bucket of little birds. Tool number one is to pick an anchor bird. What's an anchor bird? An anchor bird is a bird that's familiar, that you can use as a reference to compare with other birds. It must be a common bird, present year round, and it must be easily identifiable. Second tool is to identify sorting traits, features that allow you to break a large complex group into smaller, simpler groups. So we look at this great slide from Roger Adamson. Here I see a I see a sorting trait right here. There's birds with solid colored heads on the far left and the far right, and there are birds with stripes in their heads in the uh, uh, down the middle. That's a sorting trait that will help us break these up into groups. So this is our first anchor bird. This is the white-crowned sparrow. This again, this is a great anchor bird because it's here year round. It's easily identifiable once you become familiar with it. And it's always here. There's always white-crowned sparrows on our coast. So you can always use them for reference. So what makes this a white-crowned sparrow? Let's become familiar with this bird first. It is a plain breasted bird. That's going to be our primary sorting trait for the first part of this video. It's a plain breasted sparrow. Sparrows are small birds, heavy build. This is a plain breasted sparrow. It has crowns on the head, striping on the heads. We see two birds here. When I was beginning birder, trying to work my way through the little brown birds, I tried for hours in the field to make the bird on the upper right be a different species of, of bird. It's not. It's a white crowned sparrow, just like the one in the lower left. It's not a female. It's, well, maybe it is a female. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We can't tell. What we do know from this photo is that it's a young bird. Young white crowned sparrows have brown and gray or brown and tan striping in the head. The adult sparrows, white crowned sparrows, have black and white striping in the head. What they do share in both ages is that yellow orange bill. That is a key feature as well. That's a, a subsidiary sorting feature for this sparrow among the plain breasteds. This is our only sparrow with an orange yellow bill. Now, if you go to the Dakotas or you go to Texas, you're going to encounter other sparrows with orange bills. But here on the Mendocino coast in Mendocino County, this is the only sparrow that's going to have that orange bill. So again, this is our anchor bird for the sorting feature of plain breastedness. Now we move on to our next sparrow. Again, we're staying in this group that I've called the plain breasted sparrows. This one, however, is quite different than the white crowned. This is a bird that occurs here only in the winter and then moves further north in the late spring and summer to breed. This is the gold crowned sparrow. What do we notice about this sparrow? Well, first of all, we notice there's not really striping on the head. It's, the head's not uh, defined by striping. Instead, it's defined by kind of this center area that's tinted gold in the, in the fall and winter and becomes bright gold in the summer. 
Secondly, we notice that the bill is not that orange, yellow orange color. This is a dark bill. To, to bi this particular individual is what we call bicolored, meaning there's the top is dark and the bottom is kind of pinkish. The other thing I want to point out about this bird is the coat of many colors across the back of the bird. Now this is typical of many sparrows, both plain-breasted and striped-breasted, as we will see. But I want you to notice that on this bird and the others, because later on in this video, that will be an important feature to note. Now, on to my third member of this plain-breasted group. This bird superficially looks an awful lot like our anchor bird, our white-crowned sparrow. The bird on the left looks like an adult white crown with the black and white striping on the head, and the bird on the lower right looks like an immature white crown sparrow with the tan striping in the head. And yet what's different about these birds, the bill color, it's not an orange bill, it's a, it's a darker bill. More importantly than that, it's that extensive yellow in the front of the face, in the region we call the lores, L-O-R-E-S. That's the area between the eye and the bill. Also notice the, the, the origin of the name, the extensive white patch in the throat. If you'll notice, white crown sparrows have a small little patch of white under the bill, but it's nowhere near as extensive as this bird. And the white crowns never have that yellow in the lures. This is not an adult on the left and an immature bird on the right. Based on the, ex the extent of the yellow in the lures, I would say these are probably both adults. White-throated sparrows come in two color morphs. There are white-striped white-throateds and there are tan-striped white-throateds. They show up together. I have one, at least one of each in my yard this winter again. Um, they, they interbreed successfully. They just happen to come in two uh, different morphs. Now I want to point out one more thing about this white-throated sparrow. Please notice the white superciliary stripe, the white uh, eyebrow stripe, the white stripe above the eye. Notice that it runs the entire length of the head all the way to the back. On the white crown sparrow, that white superciliary stripe will actually terminate prior to the back by curving up and joining the center stripe. This sounds, I, I, I don't doubt that you're rolling your eyes, but because this sounds like an arcane feature, and yet I, I, I assure you that out in the field, in a group of sparrows, that one feature will jump out at you if you become familiar with it. It will help you instantly tell the, different, uh, tell the difference between the white-throateds and the white crowns. Okay, so let's move on to our second group of sparrows, the stripe-breasted sparrows. So we just looked at three plain-breasted sparrows. Now we're going to look at the three common striped-breasted sparrows. Our anchor sparrow is in the bottom of this slide. It's the song sparrow. The upper left, we have the savanna sparrow. And on the right, the sweet little Lincoln sparrow. So this is our anchor bird for the stripe-breasted sparrow group. This is the song sparrow. Notice the, the striping in the head, the brown and gray striping in the head, the dark bill. Notice the striping in the breast. It appears to have been painted on with a, a, a magic marker, a felt, a felt tip pen, or maybe even a small paintbrush. The stripings on the breast and the belly will get so broad and so dense that they'll actually begin to coalesce and form a 
dark spot in the middle of the breast. The dark spot in the middle of the breast is a relatively weak key for this bird. You'll see it a lot, but it doesn't have to be there. What has to be there are the gray and brown stripings in the head, the dark, uh, the coating of dark stripings on the breast and belly, and the dark bill. This bird, you'll come across this bird in many places. Um, it won't always be visible. So it helps to begin to learn this bird by its song, by the sounds that it makes. The two anchor birds are both quite easily recognizable by their song. So let's begin first with this bird, the song sparrow, and then compare it to the song of the white crowned. In particular, listen to the beginning of the song of the song sparrow. Hear those opening notes? A series of short chip, 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 chip. Almost sounds as if it's warming up, cranking up the engine. Chip, 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 it starts running. Chip, 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 twee. And it's that series of short notes at the beginning that is the important part, not the other part, not whatever comes after. I don't try to remember that. The series of short notes is critical. This bird also has a very unique uh, call. Birds will sing a lot. Uh, they'll tend to sing more. Now, the song sparrow and the white crown sparrow both sing during the winter. Not all birds do. But they tend to sing more uh, commonly in the spring and early summer when they're trying to attract a mate and uh, declare their ownership of a breeding territory. They'll use a call note throughout the year as they keep in touch with one another in the bush. So let's listen to this call note of the song sparrow. Let's hear it again. A soft bark. David Fix, an ornithologist up in Humboldt County, describes the, the call of the song sparrow as the bark of a two ounce Pomeranian. I think he's spot on. It does sound like a really, really small dog barking in the bush. So that's the song and the call of our anchor bird, the song sparrow. Let's move on and listen to the song of the white crown. Oh, sorry, that's again a repeat of the song sparrow. Okay, now let's listen to the song of the white crown sparrow. In particular, I want you to pay attention again to the first note. Not a series of short notes like the song sparrow. No, this one starts with a long note. 
very distinctive, very different from the other anchor bird. Let's listen again. Tweet diddly diddly deet. Long note, chips, twitters, and whistles. It is that introductory long note that's important. Everything that follows after that is going to ch is subject to change from bird to bird, from area to area. The birds of Berkeley sing different songs than the birds of Angel Island. And also, the for in Fort Bragg, the white crowned sparrows in winter will sing differently than will the white crowned sparrows in the summer. This is one of those birds that will sing year round, so it's a great opportunity to listen and identify and remember and then compare. Okay, let's move on to the next. So, let's move on. The bird I have before you right now is called the Savannah Sparrow. Uh, it's named after Savannah, Georgia. This is a sparrow that occurs across the United States, across the lower 48. But here on the coast, there's an odd distribution. This bird is found from the edge of the bluffs 100 to 200 yards inland. It loves that little stretch of our coast. If you get beyond, let's go to Point Cabrillo. You'll find the bird down in the grasslands near the bluffs. But as you walk upwards up the hill towards the parking lot at the entrance, they stop. You'll, you won't find another savannah sparrow anywhere near the upper parking lot. They like it down by the edge of the bluffs. Now, that said, if you go to one of the Central Valley refuges, the Sacramento Refuge or the Calusa Refuge, Gray Lodge, this is going to be possibly the most common sparrow you'll see at the refuge. One of the habits, an interesting habit of this bird is that it seems to like to run rather than fly. As you walk along the trails on the headlands, this bird will scurry ahead of you on the ground and then poof, jump up and disappear into the grass. So this is a stripe-breasted sparrow. You can see the stripes beginning uh, right under the, the throat, down the flanks in particular, but it's a light sparrow. It's not a dark sparrow like the song sparrow can be. This is a light sparrow. And the other unique feature about this that helps us sort this out from the song sparrow is that yellow wash in the face. Now this particular yellow wash is not restricted to the lores, that area between the eye and the bill, but it will encompass that whole area up, up above and below the eye. You can sense it, you can see it in this photo, but as you move from winter into spring, that yellow becomes much, much uh, more noticeable, much brighter. Again, this is a bird that lives here year round. It breeds here on our headlands. So this is a bird that you will encounter if you walk along the edge of our coast, the Savannah Sparrow. Now on to the next, the third and final striped-breasted sparrow. This sweet little bird is the Lincoln Sparrow. Excuse me for sounding unprofessional, but I really love this sparrow. It is a first cousin to the Song Sparrow. You look in the guidebooks, you'll see Song Sparrow, Lincoln Sparrow, and Swamp Sparrow all together as a group. You can see it has striping on the breast, but unlike 
it, it also has the brown and tan striping in the head. But when you look at the, at, at the striping in the breast, it appears to have been applied with a pencil or a, a, a ballpoint pen rather than the song sparrow where the stripes appear to have been uh, applied with a felt pen or maybe even a small paintbrush. Also notice the, the, the striping in this bird is really limited to the upper breast and along the flanks, that area be beneath the wings down towards the, the rump, the tail of the bird. And more importantly, notice the quality of the, the hue of the feathers in the uh, upper body. This gold tint in the cheek, um, excuse me, not in the cheek, in the jawline, what we call the malar stripe, M-A-L-A-R. Basically the jawline of the bird and the upper breast. There is a sweet, subtle golden wash to this bird that is quite noticeable out in the field. This is a, a winter visitor only of our three striped sparrows. This is the only one that doesn't spend the year here. It, it will leave. This one also is harder to come across. It's harder to find because it likes the quieter areas. If you go down uh, to the pasture lands around elk, uh, if you go to other relatively quiet places, you're more likely to see this bird. Um, but you have to be patient. This is not a common uh, ubiquitous sparrow. This wouldn't Locally, you would never select this as your anchor bird because you don't see it often enough to become intimately familiar with it. Okay, so those are our three striped sparrows. Now, but wait, there's more. Let's move on. Some people include this bird with the striped sparrows as well. But as you can see, it's not striped. These are inverted triangles or chevrons on the breast and belly of this bird. This is a fox sparrow. This is a winter visitor. It's larger than the sparrows, the other six sparrows that we just visited. Um, and again, it's it shows up in the fall, it spends the winter here, and then it moves on uh, to breed in other areas. This bird typically has a bicolored bill. It doesn't show up very well in this photo. And, and there are things like the bicolored bill that arguably are a soft key. You don't want to try to identify uh, this or very many other birds by whether the bill is bicolored or, or not. It works great for surf birds, but um, sparrows seem to have a lot of variation. But remember that white crown sparrow is still the only one with a bright orange yellow bill that, that we're not moving away from that. What I do notice about this and what I want to finally point out to make a case, notice the back of this bird. It does not have that sparrow coat of many colors. This has a more uniform homogeneous one color starts at the crown of the head and moves all the way back to the tail. In a group of sparrows in your yard or out in the field, you can spot the fox sparrows from all the rest by number one, the size, they're going to be bigger, and number two, they're going to be the sparrow that doesn't have all that coloration on the back. Those are both very helpful keys to help you sort this bird out from the rest. Now, fox sparrows are the masters of the double scratch. A lot of our sparrows do employ a uh, food finding technique called the double scratch, where they hop forward and hop back, hop forward, hop back. And it allows them to uncover anything that's buried, any food item that's been buried by uh, falling leaves or needles or kicked over by dirt. Fox sparrows, like I said, are the masters of this. They're a little bit of a nuisance in that if you have a paved 
or a stepping stone walkway and dirt or mulching uh, alongside of it. These are the little critters who move that mulch back onto your walkway every day after you've swept it clean. Um, but it's their way of finding food, so I can't fault them for that. Now it's important to note that the fox sparrow is not our only bird that has a plain or uniformly colored back. Here are two birds with a similar trait. The bird on the left is the fox sparrow. And note on this bird, you can really see the bicolored bill, the dark upper mandible and the lower pay, uh, yellowish bill. Now on the right is another plain backed bird. But the fox sparrow, note the, the chevrons on the breast fading into some uh, heavy striping uh, in the flanks uh, between the wing and the leg. The bird on the right lacks any striping in that same area. It's uh, uniformly pale. Also notice the bird on the right, uh, the tail is more red than is the, uh, the back of the bird, the back or the head. The tail is a different shade of brown. It's a rufous brown. One final point, if you look carefully at the bill of the, of the two birds, the bird on the left, the fox sparrow, has a heavy sparrow conical seed-eating bill. The bird on the right has a much more slender pointed uh, bill, bill that you'd use for probing or gleaning. So let's move on and take a closer look at our bird on the right. The bird on the right is not a sparrow at all. It's a thrush, a hermit thrush, first cousin to the robin. And here on the coast in the winter, those two birds can be separated by the color of the tail. The, the fox sparrow will be plain across the back, the, the back and the tail will be of a relatively uniform color. The hermit thrush will be plain across the back, but the tail will appear to be more rufous or reddish. So let's move on to our last group of sparrows. The next three could have been included in the plain breasted group, but there are things about them that make them a little, little easier, a little separate. This is the dark eyed junco. It's a small bird, very small bird. What do you notice? The dark head and the pale bill. Juncos, dark eyed juncos made up of several races, but we, this is our common junco here on the coast. This is a winter visitor, but if you live in the foothills of the coast at a higher elevation, and if you have conifers, this may very well be a year round uh, resident for you. But here on the coast where I live at sea level, we see this bird only in the winter. Again, dark head, pale bill, and the other remarkable feature about this small bird are the white outer tail feathers. Oftentimes you'll see, uh, see them move around and there's a flash of white in the tail, a small bird with a flash of white in the tail among all the other sparrows. That flash of light in the tail belongs to the dark-eyed junco. Next. This striking bird is a spotted towhee. Many of us still refer to it as the rufous-sided towhee, a name that we learned years ago when we were first beginning. But they've recently split it into two groups, and out west we have the spotted towhee. The head is dark, black. The eye is red, dark bill. Spots across the back, rufous on the flank, and a pale white belly. This is the spotted towhee larger than the rest of the sparrows that we've seen, larger than our anchor birds, but still a sparrow. We've come to our last sparrow. This is the brown toad, excuse me, this is the California towhee. Again, there's been a recent name change that uh, many of us older birders continue to stumble over. This is the California towhee. It's a uh, relatively large sparrow, larger than our anchor birds, little orange in the eye, extensive orange in the vent, plain brown across the back and the breast. And this bird is relatively restricted in range here on the coast. We find them 
in uh, Irish Beach, and we find them uh, on the outskirts of the village of Mendocino. But otherwise, uh, this is more of an inland bird. If you go to Branscombe, uh, Compshi, Boonville, especially if you go to Willits or Ukiah, this is a very, very common bird. But here on the coast, it's much less likely to be seen. Nevertheless, I present to you the California towhee. Now, I didn't tell you at the beginning there was going to be a quiz, did I? I didn't want to scare you off, but open book, open notes. I want you to uh, work with you through going through this. Name the bird, but also think about why you know that's the bird. My one of my most uh, influential professors in all my college years was a gentleman named uh, Joe Brumbaugh. And it was Joe's assertion that it was okay to get the right answer. Uh, that's fine. It's all fine, fine and good. But then he would ask, how do you know? Are you sure? Or, do, or were you just lucky? So that stuck with me. So it's one thing to know but it's more important to know how you know. So let's go through this very quickly. Yes, white crowned sparrow. How do you know? Plain breasted bird, black and white striping in the head, tan and gray, tan and brown striping in the head for the young birds. That yellow-orange bill, that orangish bill, is a strong key. That's the white crowned sparrow. Okay, next one. Yeah, song sparrow. That's our other anchor bird, the bird by which we judge all similar birds. It's got the brown and gray striping in the head. It has the heavy striping in the breast, the dark bill, that's all you need to know. That and the song. Remember the song? How did it start? Chip, 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 chwee. Name your song. Chip, 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 chwee. Do something. That's the. Be that's how you tell the song of the song sparrow. All right. Question number three. Yes. Spotted towhee. Good sized bird, black head, black bill, red eye, rufous along the flanks, spots across the back, white belly, rufous sided toe. You're not going to confuse it with anybody else around here. All right, question number four. This is a tougher one. This is a tougher one, but you got it right. Savannah sparrow. How did you know? We saw yellow in the face. We saw that it was a striped bird with yellow in the face. We also saw that overall the appearance was that of a light bird, a light colored bird. Therefore it is, and we've seen it as we've walked along the headlands in Fort Bragg, Mendocino, Elk, Albion, the Savannah Sparrow. Easy, easy peasy. Gold crowned sparrow. It's got a gold crown, okay? It's got a plain breast, gold crown, darkish on the top of the bill, bicolor bill. Gold crowned sparrow. Give me something harder, you said. California towhee. Seldom seen here on the coast. Brown bird bigger than our uh, anchor birds. Orange in the face, orange in the vent. Next bird. Ooh, this is a little different, but if I remember, very, f it's a striped breasted bird, very fine striping in the breast. And look at all that gold wash 
underneath the in in the malar stripe the jawline across the upper breast and down the flanks that's got to be a Lincoln Sparrow Lincoln Sparrow ah, I know that bird you're right that's a fox sparrow heavy dark chevron spotting on the breast plain coloration across the back look he's been digging in the dirt look at all that dirt on his toes and on his bill like so many other sparrows he's a ground feeder but this one is an avid ground feeder um hmm. they're not they're not my anchor bird they're not my white crowned sparrow because white crowned sparrows don't have that yellow in the face. They're, these must be white throated sparrows. Good. Okay, we must just about be at the end of this. What have we got here? Small bird, dark head, pale bill, dark eyed junco. Yep, that's what it is. One more, he threw in, not a sparrow. Look at that bill. Um, spotting on the upper breast. Olive brown across the back. That tail's a different shade of brown, redder. That's a hermit thrush. So, what's this? One last sparrow. This is actually not a sparrow. This is an old world weaver finch. And yet it bears the name house sparrow or English sparrow. English sparrow because it originated in England and was brought to the United States. Once it got here, it took off like wildfire. It, it bred like Europeans and virtually colonized the entire country like Europeans. Um, this is a very, very common bird here on the coast and in any uh, urban environment and it doesn't have to be a big city it can be a small village now you may be enamored with that black in the throat and say hmm is this a black-throated sparrow this is a black-throated sparrow and no they don't live here on the coast they live in the arid southwest don't confuse the English sparrow with a black-throated sparrow so what can we say very quickly about the sparrow? It's small, got a plain breast, it's got extensive black underneath the chin. I'm talking about the male now. I'm talking about the male bird on the left. It has a gray cap. It's got a lot of rufous brown uh, behind the eye, a white cheek reminiscent of a chestnut back chickadee. The female is <laughs> the female is the quintessential little brown bird not much going for it um, and these birds like i said are ubiquitous they will uh, nest in the eaves of your house they nest in the eaves of fort bragg harvest market they make a lot of um, unpleasant noises they're non-melodic they're not not musical at all um, but they're here to stay. They're actually doing better here than they are in their home com country of England. So that is the Passer domesticus, the house sparrow. Now I wanna move on quickly to one last little group, one last group of little brown birds that will show up in your backyards during the winter if you have a feeder. Um, I, and uh, they're not sparrows, but they're finches. I want to introduce you quickly to the common finches of the winter, actually year round here in Mendocino. And ironically, I'm going to start you out with two red finches. So yeah, they're little brown birds, but oh, look at all that red. The one on the right is the house finch. The bird on the left is a house finch. The other right, the bird on the left is a house finch. The bird on the right is a purple finch. 
Let's let's look at them independently, individually. This is the purple finch. Notice the uh, purple red color is spread across most of the body. It starts in the head and it goes down the side of the head, down the throat, onto the belly, across the back, um, underneath the wings, it continues onto the tail. This whole bird has a reddish tint to it. This bird has a very broad white um, superciliary. Remember that word? Above the eye, a uh, superciliary stripe that barely shows because of it's masked by that red tint. And yet it, that stripe is there. Um, also note the heaviness of the bill, particularly the lower mandible. It's got a very heavy seed cracking bill. I want to compare that with the house finch. In the house finch, that the red is more localized. There's red patches in the head, a little bit down the, the breast, especially as we get into breeding season. But across the back of the bird, it's primarily brown. So this is really a brown bird with some red patches. So we have here a house finch pair. The male is the brightly colored bird on the left, and the female is the little brown bird on the right. I want to focus on the female. Her head is uh, relatively small and rounded. The bill is not that particularly large. It's fairly evenly proportioned top and bottom. The eye appears rather small, but critical is the striping in the flanks of the female finch. Notice the area right under the wings, how heavily striped that is. That is an important feature to keep in your memory bank because you're going to see that in the winter and in the summer, and it'll help you identify the female house finch. Notice the female purple finch. The flanks, that area right under the wing, it's a mottled, mottled brown. But you don't get the sense of uh, distinct striping. Also notice the head on this bird. The bill is much larger than that of the house finch. And the female really shows that superciliary stripe. So again, this is the female purple finch. This is also a finch. We just looked at the heavy bill of the purple finches. We're going to look at the, the uh, pointed bill of this finch. In fact, this finch is so kind of off to the side that its common name isn't finch. This is a pine siskin, and, uh, but it is a finch. And some, we'll go years without seeing pine siskins here on the coast. But then periodically their food supply up in the uh, northern Canada, and, uh, up in Canada and the northern U.S., their food supply will crash. And they descend upon the lower 48 in great numbers. And this happens to be one of those years. So you are very likely to encounter pine siskin this winter. They'll, they'll mob your feeders, if you have, particularly if you have a thistle feeder. This is a, a sock filled with Niger thistle. They'll mob it and they'll empty it in a day. But what I want to point out about this bird is the hint of yellow in the barring on the wings, in the striping on the wings. There's a yellow quality. It doesn't quite come across as well as I'd hoped in this photo, but you'll see it in the field. Now there'll be a dozen, two, three dozen of these in a big group on the ground. And the temptation, as is the case in any large group of birds, is to basically dismiss them as, oh, there's a group of siskins. But I challenge you to look carefully. Look at the bird in the center. 
There's no striping in the flanks or the breast. It's an unstriped bird. This ve looks very similar to the siskin, but again, look at the bill. It's a much heavier bill. This is a finch. This is a gold finch. Despite the color, it's an American gold finch. And these will be our last finches. Here I have on the left the American goldfinch in winter. You know the American goldfinch in summer. It's a bright, brilliant yellow bird with a black cap. In the winter, they change colors. They become this. I don't know if there's even a name for that color. But uh, it's a, a much quieter color, but they retain those very loud, if you will, black wings with the white bars. So that's the American goldfinch on the left. And on the right is the lesser goldfinch, again, in winter. And what's noticeable about this bird is that it retains its yellow uh, breast and its black cap in the winter. Unlike the American goldfinch, the winter lesser finch looks just like the summer lesser finch. And they're both found here on the coast, although the American goldfinch is uh, much more common. The lesser goldfinch still can be found here. <sighs> okay, so that's it, folks. That's my uh, guided excursion through the winter world of sparrows and finches that are common here on the coast. Now, I've skipped um, the rare sparrows that we see rarely. That's why they're rare birds, such as the uh, a snow bunting, the Lapland long spur, the Vesper sparrows. It, we've seen enough. That said, if you wish, to, to learn more about this group, the sparrows. I highly, highly recommend this particular book, David Beadle and James Rising, The Sparrows of the United States and Canada, the, pho the Photographic Guide. This book is very important if you uh, plan to go bird watching uh, outside of California, say to the Dakotas, uh, to Arizona, Texas. Uh, this, this book covers the 64 different sparrow species that are found in the U.S. Now, 64 species of sparrows is, uh, remember we started this, this session by breaking the sparrows down into smaller groups so that we could, so we could study them uh, more simply. When you've got 64, it's a completely daunting task. So when I go to a new area uh, where I don't know the sparrows, and it could just be as close as Ukiah, what I do is I get, I get a checklist for that area. I want to, this Mendocino Coastal Area Birds checklist that, that Toby put together a number of years ago. It takes that 64 species that you find in, in Rising's book or that you find in the National Geographic uh, a field guide, and it breaks them down into eight or nine that are commonly found on the coast in the winter. So it's makes your, it, it allows you to focus on what is likely, what am I likely to see? It's that old saying, when you hear hooves, think horses, not zebras. And that's the way it is with finches. When you're out in the, out in the field, kind of know where you're going to go in the, in the field guide, which, which birds are likely and which ones can you just flip right past. Okay. I want to give a special thanks to the photographers who made this uh, video bearable. Uh, otherwise, it would just be, be me talking, which isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to work. And I also want to point out that I borrowed the sound recordings from the Cornell Guide to Bird Songs. So as we say goodbye, 
And as we stare at this fantastic photo from Ron LaValle of the tundra swans, which are much easier to identify than sparrows, flying over a nearly full moon, I want to make one final point. The only way that you can truly learn the sparrows or any other bird, but for that matter, is not from reading and memorizing the field guides. All those pretty pictures are great for showing you the key features, what, what, what to look for, and to begin to plant an image in your mind of what a white-throated sparrow might look like. But it's not until you experience that white-crowned sparrow, white-throated sparrow out in the field that you really truly begin to learn it. When I was a beginning birder, the way that I truly learned how to identify the birds was to go out with those who knew them in the field and watch them, watch the birds, ask the questions, listen to the stories of, of the experienced birders, learn about the habits, learn how they move. Uh, that is how you will learn their songs, learn their calls, and begin to tell the uh, real subtleties, begin to unlock the subtleties of the bird world and really increase your appreciation and uh, become a better birder. So with that thought, I, I really hope that you will join us on one of our field trips or on one of our bird walks. Please tune in to Mendocino Coast Audubon.org. I Google Mendo Coast Audub and it takes me right there. Check the calendar, watch to see when we're having a field trip or a bird walk, and come join us. And hopefully you'll be start to learn them one at a time the way we all did. All right, thank you for your patience. It's been my pleasure to work with you on this. Happy birding.